Hey everybody, it's Irene with Brainstorm Makers, and today we're going to talk about controlling insects. If I want to spray for those during the day, say I have, I know that I'm not going to be around after dark and I just, I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this. I got to do something now because they're doing damage by the minute. BT. Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacillus. It's a bacteria. And you spray it on the leaves. And anything that eats that leaf, whether it's a tomato hornworm or a squishy cucumber beetle thing or any other kind of critter that eats that leaf is going to ingest the bacillus. It's going to get into the, the, the insect's gut. It's going to make them go sort of lethargic and they'll be dead within 24 hours. There are versions of BT that can be used in still water. So I have a cattle tank out there and I use it for watering the garden. The water that's an open top to it, there's no filtration, there's none of this kind of stuff. So it is what it is and sometimes we get mosquitoes in there. It hasn't happened in a couple of years, but I have what they call mosquito dunks, which are a form of Bacillus thuringiensis. You just toss one of these things, look like a donut, it's about that big. It's made out of uh, barley, I think? Barley, rice bran, something like that. It's a grain soaked with this stuff. And it sits there and the Bacillus gets out into the water and it kills the itty bitty wiggly little bits and pieces that the mosquitoes make. Okay, you've killed the mosquitoes as nymphs. You don't have adult mosquitoes. Simple. If an animal were to drink that water, won't hurt them a bit. Won't hurt them a bit. You can put it in cattle tanks that are actually being used to water cattle if you want to. Although usually they, you don't get so many mosquitoes in there because the cattle are splashing the water up. But knowing what to use and not to be afraid of it is an important part of this. You know, if you have a bug problem, look it up online. This, one, this one's kind of a special one. I, I, I love this because it's, uh, it's another bacillus. It says, for control of plant diseases in and around homes and gardens. It's a bacillus and it will have a, <laughs> they use big words, aqueous suspension of a biofungicide and a bactericide. So this is actually more for disease, but you have fungus, you have bacteria problems of some sort. This guy, fighting bacteria with bacteria. How cool is that? You know, let them, let them wipe out their brethren. I got no problem with that. Liquid cop. I use that sometimes in the greenhouse. It is a copper solution. It can be used, uh, on citrus, fruits, nuts, vegetables, and ornamentals. It's copper. Copper, like some, like several other metals, actually, because silver is the same way. It has it has antibacterial uh, characteristics. It has antifungal cop characteristics. Copper has been used in the grape industry for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. You dust the grapevines with copper and sulfur to knock down the fungus, because the last thing you want is fungus on your grape vines. Some of these are actually a combo. Let's see, this one is spinosad with other stuff. Uh, that's plain neem. This one is the Monterey Ant Control. I haven't used it yet, but I need to, because I've got ant problems out there, which is why I bought it. This uses a combination of iron phosphate and spinosad. And I did read the details of how it works. For outdoor use around residential sites, it's OMRI approved, considered all these things. If you even sort of vaguely follow the instructions, you're not gonna kill your dogs, cats, or anything else. And they're not scary. Don't be afraid to use insecticides where it's relevant. 
If you have two tomato plants, I don't want to see you out there spraying them to death. Don't be so lazy. Get out there and pick the bugs off of them. Unless you have something like a flea beetle infestation. I'm sorry, flea beetles are the bane of everyone's existence. What do Johnny's and Haas say about flea beetles? They say their favorite thing. Let's see, John, Johnny's doesn't have a favorite thing. That's funny. Uh, but they say there's several different solutions. The, the uh, insect spray by this one, which is a Spinosad product, will work well. Mycotrol, anything that says myco, think mycelium, That's, that means you're using a fungus. Flea beetles here, fruit tree spray. I don't remember which, what the fruit tree spray has in it. I don't have that with me. That may have a spinosad in it. Um, yeah, spinosad is another thing they list here specifically. Take down garden spray, I think that also has, um, take, has spinosad in it. Neem oil works good on it. Bug buster. The nice thing is that most of these things can be mixed and matched. So for instance, if I had a big problem going on with both fungus and uh, some sort of bugs, I could actually mix a couple of these together and I'm not going to blow up the world. I'm just going to knock down the bugs harder. And that might take the fungus with it too. Don't be afraid to try this stuff. Don't be afraid to use the stuff, but do read the instructions. You know, like I said here, BT and friends. <laughs> well, Bacillus. BT handles all kinds of caterpillars and squishy little things. This Bacillus will handle the fungal end of it. Not bad. So with two bacillus, you could cover everything. Caution is always the best answer to everything. But don't get freaked out about using insecticides. They are just another tool. But if you are a person who cannot follow a doctor's instructions on how to use a medication, maybe you shouldn't use it. I think most of you guys care about your gardens and are capable of following basic instructions. Like I say, these things all come with something that looks like this. Let's see if I can get this guy to peel open. That's probably the hardest thing about these is they don't like to peel open. Here we go. They have a sticky book in the back and it has lots of small print. That's the hardest thing for me is sometimes the print's kind of small. But at the very beginning, It'll t say how much of this stuff to use per pint, quart, or gallon, okay? Some of these are used uh, commercially sometimes, so it'll say something like, well, apply, you know, this much per acre. No. <laughs> and once in a while, you'll find something that makes me laugh because I'm like, hmm, I don't think I have an acre. But somewhere in the instructions, it will always say something ha handy like, okay, I'm going to use a half a tablespoon in a pint of water. Okay, <laughs> I can do that. It'll also have somewhere in here, it's one of the reasons these are such book, big books is they're usually in at least two languages, sometimes three. Ah, the infamous charts. These are cool. If you're ever bored, read a chart. They will have lots and lots of things <laughs> and these kind of things will be, okay, let's see. Strawberry, it'll, it'll have the name of the crop, uh, which pests are controlled on it, and the maximum number of applications per calendar year, and the maximum days to wait before reapplying, the minimum days, rather, to wait before reapplying, and the minimum days to wait from last application to harvest. That's pretty simple. So if I've got strawberries, and I have, these are tiny little prints. If I have light brown apple moths on my strawberries, I can spray my strawberries up to five times per year. And I have to wait five days before I reapply. And I have to wait one day before I harvest. Really simple. They don't expect anyone in, who's reading this to have a college degree. They expect you to be able to read, and being able to follow instructions is good. But one of the nice things about this is that if you're not 100% sure what you have, sometimes being able to go to the list 
and it'll say something like uh, fruiting vegetables, including eggplant, ground cherry, okra, pep pepino, pepper, tomatillo, and, and tomato. Okay, so I have one of those plants and it's got a problem. Uh, let's see, I've got, I've got flea beetles. Okay, oh, it says it'll take care of the flea beetles. And the maximum number of times I can uh, apply it per calendar year is six. Okay. And the minimum days to wait before reapplying is four. And the minimum days to wait from last application to harvest is one. See, a lot of these, the minimum time to wait is one day. So I could spray today and harvest tomorrow afternoon and not have a problem. And that's one of the things I like about this stuff. It doesn't hang around. It's not like seven. It's not going to hang around for for three months. Now, if I was really concerned, say the way, the best way to spray is to wait until the bees have gone to bed. Is there still a risk that you could accidentally kill a pollinator? Yeah, there is because sometimes like in my squash and stuff like that, I have bumblebees that will sleep in the flowers at night. So if I wasn't being careful and I was spraying my squash, which I don't normally do at all, but if I was playing my squash and there was a bumblebee sleeping in there, I might zap them. Um, to be honest, most of the plants I'm spraying don't have bumblebees sleeping in them. They're usually things like the husk cherries, which have a small sort of tomato-like flower. Actually, it's slightly smaller than a regular tomato flower. So you, the bumblebees wouldn't sleep in there. Bumblebees sleep in big squash flowers because it's a comfy bed. And it's, you know, it's, it's lovely. They're sitting there next to their dinner, basically. <laughs> Reminds me of some people I knew in college. Sleep next to the dinner so you can just grab some more when you're hungry. You know, shake well and use. If I was super concerned and wanted to make sure I could never possibly kill a pollinator, what would I use? BT. It's not going to kill everything that's out there. It'll kill almost everything if it's a chewing insect. If it's a tomato hornworm, if it's a squishy sort of caterpillary thing. We have flies in here today that are driving me crazy. The cat was taking too long to get in and out today, and so was Jack. Ah, anyway, BT, I can spray any time of day, and that's one of the handy things about it. So if I know I have no time after dark or at you know after the bees have gone to bed, I mean, it depends on where you live in the United States, but in the New England area, the bees don't go to bed until 8 or 9 o'clock at night in the summertime. So that means you're out there pretty much with a headlamp. And I've been out here with a headlamp before spraying um, because I really do make a serious effort that if I have to spray something that is not totally non-toxic to... Um, pollinators, I will get there. I either get out super early in the morning before the bees get up or I get out there after they've gone to bed. And then I can spray neem or spinosad or any of the other things and not have to worry about it. Because as long as those things are dry before the bees and other pollinators arrive, it's not going to hurt them. That's what the problem with things like seven is that stuff can kill something that flies in two weeks later. So that's why, I, like I say, if there was one thing I could ban, it would be seven. But there are some dangerous things out there. You know, if you read stuff, if you read, say, nature's care will be the pyrethrin. So it'll tell you never to throw this into a body of water. Don't let it run off into ditches. Don't, you know, why are you spraying so much that it's going to run off into a ditch, you know? That's usually a problem with, well, with agricultural sprayers. If you have ever watched an agricultural sprayer come through, it's a monster machine and it's got big spray nozzles. And if you have the misfortune of driving down the highway when they're spraying, you can smell it and you're sitting there wondering what you're breathing in and what kind of terrible things it's going to do to you. But that's not the way we do business in the, in the garden. You know, I have a small sprayer that I picked up cheap at Harbor Freight and does a great job for me. It's completely washable. Uh, it's plastic, so it's not going to hold any goop as long as you rinse it good afterwards. And to be honest, I don't even bother worrying about that with these because they're all compatible. If I decide that I'm having trouble with a couple of different things at once, I can mix these together 
and just spray it and it's not a problem. Or if there's a little bit left, now one thing I do recommend with all these, remember I've said that these don't hold. In other words, you have to make them and use them right away. So I'll make up my half gallon and I will spray the plants that I was meaning to spray. So I've been spraying husk cherries because the Colorado potato beetles, I mean the uh, cucumber beetles are such a pain at this time of year. And they just make this terrible mess of the plants and chew the bejesus out of them. And you can go out there one day and they look fine and the next day they look like they've been insanely chewed to death. I can spray that and now I've got the plants soaked. I mean, I've lifted the leaves, I've sprayed. And the nice thing about this stuff is I, I try not to get it on myself too much, but especially BT, I really don't worry about. So I don't bother to put rubber gloves on or anything else with BT. So I'm picking up the leaves with my left hand and spraying underneath with the right hand, that sort of thing. Get in there real good. You know, I don't purposefully try and breathe it, but I don't worry about whether I am breathing it particularly. I just, I don't like the smell of most things. So I'm careful. I'm careful when I use cleaners around the house. You don't want to breathe that stuff. So you spray it up and you've still got two cups of the stuff left and you're like, okay. I walk over to the potatoes. I'm like, something's been munching on the potatoes, okay? <laughs> and I'll just spray the tops or I'll, get, I'll spray the bean plants a little bit because there's always something that's going to go bite on a bean plant. I can use the rest of it. If I want to, I can rinse the sprayer when I'm done. If I don't feel like it, I don't have to rinse the sprayer when I go. I just mix whatever I put in there next because there's no long-term toxic effect from any of these things. They're going to degrade. They're just going to plain degrade within 24 to 48 hours. And it's not a problem. And these are all compatible anyway. So come up with a plan. If you know what kind of bugs you have in your area, get the stuff the year before if possible. Okay, if it's your first garden and you're just learning all that stuff, Go to the big box stores, just read the labels, uh, make sure you're dealing with an Omri project product. It simply says on here, for organic gardening, Omri listed, and then it's got the name of the company. And O-M-R-I, for organic use. That's what the, the organic farmers are required to use. And you saw, I read the instructions on how this stuff gets used. It's not hard. Don't hesitate to use it. Can you overuse it? Highly unlikely. I mean, most of us don't really enjoy spraying all that much. I mean, I have other things to do. <laughs> I only spray when I need to, you know. I've got a couple spots in the yard. I'm going to have to put some ant control down because their ants have just gotten to be so obnoxious and aggressive. And they'll start farming aphids, and that's another whole set of problems. So I need to put some of that down. I'll read the instructions again because it's been a while since I read them. I'm always careful. I don't allow the dog or the cat to be around when I'm spraying simply because I don't want to be interrupted. I don't want to have to worry about them licking on something or doing something silly. I mean dogs and cats are not always the most sensible critters. But once it's dry I know that it's really nothing to be concerned about. So don't let yourself be intimidated. I do recommend staying away from the weird chemical sprays that you're not sure what's in there. If you stick with things that are Omri, they will be all derived from regular products. They won't have been made in a chemical factory. There are some, what they call them, pyrethroids, which are chemical, quote unquote, chemical lookalikes of the pyrethrins. Now remember, the pyrethrins are things that come from chrysanthemum roots. And I did read some of the stuff about some of those, and I'm not really comfortable with them. You know, it's always a personal choice. I know people who use seven. I want to say you're not invited to my house, but, <laughs> you know, don't try and use it in my yard. I'll stop you and throw you off the property. You know, pollinators are one of our most precious resources whether we're talking about bees or little teeny wasps or, I mean, half of the bugs that are in my garden doing the pollinating are not even bees. Some of them, I have no idea what they are even, but they're still doing the pollinating. We get tons and tons of little kinds of wasps, some of which are in their spare time bumping around out there and eating bugs, laying their eggs on the larvas of other bad bugs. Pretty cool. When we can encourage those guys, so much the better. 
Hope this didn't confuse you too much. If you have specific issues, don't hesitate to ask questions. It's not really that scary. It's a little annoying sometimes when you're trying to read the fine print because it's all teeny tiny print. That's why I kind of recommend that people go to something like a Johnny's or a Haas Tools and just get the, uh, the charts that they put together. Most of my stuff, I've used some of the products from Johnny's before. I've used Dipel because Dipel is just a um, commercial name for BT. I've used that before. And some of their, there's some overlap between these two. Um, most of the Haas Tools products are Monterey which is very, very commonly available in every big box store, pretty much. If you get their chart on what to use, it makes it super simple. You know, I have leaf miners, what do I do? Let's see, spin a sad. Okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you don't need a ton of these. For most, your average gardener, I would say BT and either Neem or spin a sad. You could get both if you wanted would handle it just about everything. Like I say, if you want to throw in diatomaceous earth, you could. I'm skeptical. If I had chickens, I would have diatomaceous earth because I would be sprinkling it in their food and I'd be uh, sprinkling it around because it seems to help with mites, especially when they do dust baths and stuff like that. It helps to control the mites. I personally have had mm, sort of mediocre response to uh, to diatomaceous earth, I never felt it was particularly effective. And I don't like fussing around that much. I want to spray it and get it done with, or pick it and get it done with, and get on. Because the point of having a garden is to be able to enjoy it and relax in it and things like that, not to have to go spray it all the time. <laughs> so if I can apply something and know that, now I'm still watching every single day, but if I can apply something and know that I probably won't have to do anything again for a week, I prefer that. Whereas if I'm using something that tends to blow off, wash off, or just go away too fast to do its job, more work for me. I don't need that. I have lots of other things to do. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. It's pretty straightforward. Like I say, this is the list of the majority of things that are used in organic gardening in terms of insecticides. That is the, the list. And 90% of the other things, I'll sit there and I'll go, oh, I've never heard of that before. And then I read the d description of what's in the ingredients, because I'm a big ingredient reader. And it'll be one of these plus something else. Sometimes they'll take a spinosad or a neem and they'll add some other thing to try and make it better for knocking down fungus or something like that. So be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And until next time, bye.